We're doing pretty good for time, all things considered. I think we're only about 50 minutes late at this stage, which has got to be something like a small miracle given the amount of presentation. But we still have a lot to go. So let me just quickly say what I really stood up here to say. And I want you all to listen real close to this. Tomorrow in the morning, we're going to have a few presentations and that kind of stuff. But we're actually going to go into some small group discussions because we want you to listen to these presentations and make sense of it in particular ways. And let me tell you the four topics that we're going to be dealing with tomorrow morning, just so as you're listening, you can be thinking about these topics and think, where can I park this thought? Or what are some thoughts I'm having in terms of ideas and so on? So there's four topics are firstly, standardization of methods and technologies for mercury assessment. We are gonna hear a lot about these technologies and methodologies. Well, how do we standardize them so that it's not just Benita doing shit thing and Rotel doing shit thing, but Guyana doing a standard thing. So that's one topic, standardization. Second is, how do we convert all of this knowledge into policies? How do we take all of this out of this room into the real world where power, government, politics, all of the rest of it exists and let this information and knowledge work for Guyana? So that's another area that we have to think about. The third is community empowerment. How do we empower communities with this kind of knowledge? and help communities to be their own best advocates in terms of their interests around mercury in particular. And then finally, any thoughts you might be having about next steps for research and innovation. You are working in an area where new things are very possible. Technology, for example, makes a lot more possible now than we could have done before. So in your own mind, as you're listening to the presentations, as you're dreaming about this conference tonight when you're sleeping, before you come tomorrow, think about these four areas and where you, you can't go in all the groups, but at least put your thoughts down as you take your notes so that tomorrow when we have these small group discussions, we're able to do that with your considered opinion. We good? So let me come off the floor and pass you back to Hitazmin. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Lawrence. So uh, before we get uh, back into it, 30 seconds, I want to just quickly recognize our DVC for institutional advancement, uh, Dr. Eiffel. She's been with us since early in the morning. I want to formally recognize her here. And I want to recognize our professor of practice, uh, Pat Francis, who is right across there. She is the uh, head of the UGIRE, which is the UG Innovation and Research uh, an entrepreneurship arm. Uh, I'm happy that she's here, and I, I'm, I'm going to say that she's going to be here tomorrow morning also. To it's when you mentioned the innovation that I thought we should flag this um, as part of the discourse that will come up. Okay. All righty. Um, thanks uh, to our gentlemen just now for those words. Okay, so we are going into our next session on findings. We actually have two more sessions. We're going to have five presentations um, now, and then we'll have a panel discussion, um, 10 minutes or so. And then we'll move to the last two presentations in the findings segment of the conference. Um, so if we can have the next five presenters, make sure you're lined up. Your presentation is with the technical team. We're going to start off with uh, Ms. Sarah Singh. Uh, please welcome her also. Many of these presentations that you're going to hear, I believe, are all undergraduate um, projects that were done in various disciplines here at the University of Guyana. I know we're going to have chemistry, biology, and environmental studies and science as well. So please welcome uh, one of our presenters, Sarah. Okay. Um, can everyone hear me? Good afternoon, everyone. 
My name is Sir Singh, and for my research project, I examined the occurrence and types of heavy metals in boundary crabs and mangrove crabs, also called bulk crabs, from gold mining areas. Um, the industrialization and urbanization eras resulted in heavy metal pollution, which is the release of non-degradable and naturally occurring metals having an atomic number greater than 20 and an elemental density greater than 5 grams per cubic centimeter that are associated with pollution. It can be sourced from insecticides, weathering of metal containing rocks, mining, domestic sewage, and others. Heavy metals such as cadmium, lead, and mercury can bioaccumulate in plants and animals and humans, especially in aquatic environments due to many processes that affect aquatic organisms like crabs, which will, which will be the main focus of this presentation. The two species under observation are the blue-violet boundary crab, which is about 110 millimeter by 102 millimeter and inhabits muddy and sandy aquatic and terrestrial habitats. They use their chilipeds to crush and tear up their food and mate during July, August. Okay. Um, the bluish yellow with pinkish legs mangrove crab measures about 4.1 centimeters by 5.8 centimeters. It inhabits mudflats associated with mangroves, where the adults feed on mangrove litter and ingest sediments, while juveniles feed on polychaetes, worms, and microorganisms. The aim of my research was to determine the socioeconomic status of Region 1 crab catchers and the presence of various heavy metals in crab species um, from mined and unmined areas in the region. These are my objectives. Part of this research was conducted in the Brimamora Passage, which is the largest and most intact mangrove ecosystem located in Region 1 that expands to around 50,000 hectares, of which 14,000 hectares are mangrove forests. It contains four villages, namely Smith Creek, Aruka, Morawana, and Imbotero, which is where the crab species were harvested from. It is the most populated village in the area, containing warrows and Venezuelan migrants that depend on the diverse natural resources for food and income. On the other hand, Port Kaituma is a more populated and biodiversity poor area in Region 1 that is inhabited mostly by Guyana's indigenous peoples, Venezuelan migrants, and others. It is mostly affected by gold mining that contributes heavily towards he that contributes heavy metal pollution in the area. To determine the sampling size and socioeconomic status of crab catchers, 430 adults from Imbotero, Smith Creek, Morawana, Aruka, and Port Kaituma were interviewed using structured open and closed questions through in-person interviews and over telephone interviews. As you can see, it was quite a process. I had to paddle around in a canoe just to get my interviews done. During May 2022, five adult boundary crabs were harvested from farmlands in Imbotero and along the Kaituma River by directly inserting the crab catcher's arm into the gallery. This is called the Brashe Mento method. Five mangrove crabs were harvested from the mangrove forest found along Imbotero Creek and Kaituma River by using a cutlass to dig around the crab's holes, stuffing the holes with leaves and mud to suffocate the crabs and force them to resurface after some time, and then pulling the crabs out with your bare hands. The crabs were then tagged and stored in quick. The samples were then washed, measured, weighed, and dissected to obtain 20 grams of muscles from their legs, abdomen, the filatorax, which were then sent to Gaisuku's lab. To digest the crab samples for cadmium, copper, and lead analysis, 
the samples were oven dried, after which one gram of each sample was transferred to a flask containing concentrated nitric acid. The samples were digested on a hot plate in a fume hood, allowed to cool, transferred to a volumetric flask using a filter paper, and the filtrate was diluted to the 100 ml mark with distilled water before shaken vigorously to, and left to stand for one hour. To digest the, sap, the crab samples for mercury analysis, the samples were homogenized in a food processor and dried in an oven. 0.5 of each sample was placed in a digestion vessel with 10 ml nitric acid and left opened in a fume hood for at least 30 minutes, after which the contents were digested. After cooling, the digested samples were transferred to a volumetric flask to which 60 ml of potassium permanganate solution was added. The vessel was left for at least two hours 100 ml of hydroxylene chloride solution was slowly added and deionized H2O was added until the sample reached the 100 ml mark. To analyze the digested crop samples for the presence of cadmium, copper, and lead, flame atomic absorption spectrophotometry was used, and for mercury, cold vapor atomic absorption was used. Quantitative data was analyzed using descriptive statistics on pair two sample t test, one sample t test, and simple linear regression test. Qualitative data was analyzed into differences and similarities. The socioeconomic status is social standing or class of an individual or group measured by their education, income, and occupation. The majority of the interviewees were for one to four to five years old crab catchers from Imbatero, who only attended up to primary school and had seven members in their household. The crab catchers from the Brimamore Passage depend on the boundary and mangrove crab species for food and to sell at the market for a thousand to twelve hundred dollars per quake. This is around ten crabs in a quake. They harvest more than 15 crabs a day for two or more days a week all year round to sustain themselves and their families. However, due to many factors such as over-harvesting, climate change, and alternative livelihoods, there was a decrease in crab catching over the last year. Finally, and importantly, due to the low education levels in the Bremamora Passage, the majority of crab catchers are unaware of the impacts of gold mining on the crab species. Now for the heavy metal analysis, a comparison between the heavy metal concentrations of the Bundary and mangrove crabs demonstrated that the Bundary crabs had the most lead and copper concentrations, and the mangrove crab had the most mercury concentrations. Cadmium concentrations were below the metal detection limit of 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. There were no differences between the lead copper and mercury concentrations of the Bundary and mangrove crab species from Imbatero. A comparison between the heavy metal concentrations of Imbatero and Kaituma River demonstrated that the Kaituma River had the highest lead, copper, and mercury concentrations. There was a difference between the lead and mercury concentrations of Bundary crabs and mercury concentrations of mangrove crabs between the two areas. <clears throat> A comparison between the heavy metal concentrations and FAO organization limits demonstrated that all samples had lead concentrations above the limits. The Bundary crabs had the co copper concentrations above the limits, while the mangrove crabs had the copper concentrations below the limits. The Bundary and mangrove crab samples from Imbatero were below the mercury limits, and the Bundary and mangrove crab samples from the Kaituma River had the mercury concentrations above the limits. <clears throat> These results prove that mangrove crabs from Imbatero are the safest for consumption. Finally, there is no linear relationship between the weight of the crabs and their heavy metal content, the width of the crabs and their heavy metal content, and the length of the crabs and their heavy metal content. <clears throat> the limitations, the number of heavy metals to be tested for was limited due to financial implications. The number of samples for the Bundary and mangrove crabs were limited due to financial implications, and the AAS are the most affordable in the laboratory was inoperative. Thank you for listening to my presentation. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Sarah. You actually had just four more seconds. 
Um, um, so just to note that your Kaituma area, in relation to what we are talking about, the Kaituma River had the higher um, mercury content, which I think we kind of expected. So let's go to our next presenter. We have Joanna Hope. Um, and then we'll go to Mr. Tramal Afra as well. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joanna Hope, and I did my research project in 2018. The title was The Impact of Water Quality on Fish Diversity, Abundance, and Richness, and richness in Mining Impacted and Non-Impacted Areas, specifically in the Kaichur National Park area. So we know... <laughs> Um, so even though fresh water accounts for only 1% of the Earth's surfaces, we know that it provides a habitat for over 40% of the aquatic species, of the fish species specifically. However, the ecosystem of a freshwater lake and river can be extremely fragile, and the human activities can be detrimental on it. We know that when we build hard structures like dams and water diversion systems, and we pollute it via agricultural and industrial runoff, all of these things can impact the environment. Um, and we know that gold mining, artisanal small-scale gold mining, is one way that freshwater ecosystems are polluted. It, even though ASGMs are a financial beneficial trade in the country, well, not just Guyana, but many other countries, it contributes to the, and it contributes to the profit influx. It provides li livelihood for millions of people worldwide. And due to the locations of these mines, which are found primarily along the rivers and lake banks, it is easy for waterways, sediments, and soils to be contaminated by the mining chemicals. The aim of my research was to determine the impact of water quality on diversity, abundance, and richness of fishes in the Kaichur National Park. It was a research that was done in collaboration with Protected Areas Commission and Guyana Geology and Mines Commission. It was myself along with Ms. Davis. We worked, worked together on this project. I had four objectives. They were to compare the fish diversity, abundance, and richness between mining and non-mining sites in the Kaichur National Park, to compare water quality parameters between mining and non-mining areas, to evaluate the relationship between the water quality parameters and fish diversity, abundance, and richness, in these mining and non-mining areas, and to determine the levels of mercury in selected fish species in mining and non-mining areas. So these were the sample sites. It was four sample sites were chosen. Ichira, which is in the orange. Then we have the Pataro River area that is in the blue. We have Murimuri Muri outlined in the yellow. And above the falls is two kites. Well, below the falls are on it, it's actually. Below the falls is two sites, and so those were the sample areas. In in um, Ichirak, we had seven sample points. In Murimuri, Muri, we had 10 sample points, five sample points in the Pataro River, and then five sample points in Tukai. So my method, um, we did habitat evaluation and water quality testing. For the habitat evaluation, it was the biophysical crop characteristics that were taken, like the habitat type, the water color, the use of the adjacent lands and wetlands, the aquatic vegetation, if there was a presence or absence, and the presence of absence of anthropogenic activities, and what type of anthropogenic activities were being done, and also the atmospheric conditions. We also did the water physiochemical conditions, which included the water depth, Turbidity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, and salinity. Now for the fish sampling, we did stratified random sampling, and we used a combination of drag stain, gill net, 
Hamnet, and Hokenlein. For the drag scene, we did a total of 10 drags. And in order to standardize that, every time we came up, we would have collected a new species of fish sample. We did a plus five method where we added an additional five drags. The hook, the hook and net, well, the hook and line, sorry, was done like on a down, on our downtime because that was what the um, residents of the area that were along with us, that's what they used to collect their fish to make our dinner or meal. Uh, yeah, so the fish were measured. The morpho morphometric analysis, we used the electric ca electronic caliper and a normal 12 inch ruler. Um, and after we did the measurement for the larger fish species that we had identified to do the mercury analysis on, we collected the sample by with using the Scalp, a scalpel. We took a hundred. We took a hundred grams, with by ex removing the muscle tissue with the scalpel. So for the results, as we see, Tukite had the largest richness, um, a total of a eight hundred and ten individual fish samples were collected, and we found that they belonged to four two species and nine families. The highest was a Tukite, and Pataru had the least amount. What well, if we go, yeah. So if we look at this, the reason, the reasoning behind why two kites would have had a richer species is because it was the farthest away from the known mining areas. Because Chinapau was an established, we know that there is mining done there, and then Ichirak also has mining camps along there. So the farther away from the mining camp, the more richer the area was of fish species. Diversity and evenness. Once again, two kites had the highest diversity and evenness. Um, and Pataro had the yeah, Pataro had the lowest. Two kites being farther away again would have the greater evenness and the greater diversity. Abundance, Pataro. So even though Pataro was at the intersection of mining areas. The reason why we would have proposed that it, well, what the reasoning behind why it may have had the higher abundance is because the animal, the fish species would have already become adapted to that area. And what it is, is that smaller fish, smaller fish species adapt more easily to contaminated areas. So that's why in, in Sotaro, you would find a larger abundance of species. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is right. <laughs> okay, the graph. I don't know. I don't know why the graph was not showing up, but it was just a graph showing the, well, a table showing the average value of each water quality parameter across the different sites. And there was not much, there wasn't any noticeable difference with the water quality parameters across the four different sites. And yeah. Um, but for the next few graphs, it, it was noticed, what we noticed was that there was no statistical significance, be, as no statistical significance relationship between water quality parameters and the species abundance in Ichirak, Murimuri, or Pataro. But that, that outline there <laughs> was to show that there, but it was only at Tukai that there was any statistical significance. And that was between electric electronic electric conductivity and TDS. I don't know why it's not showing. Okay. Um, so on this table, this table just showed all of the species that were collected throughout the sampling period. Now we know that the recommended level of mercury in fresh water is freshwater fish specifically is 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. And that is what is outlined in the blue. And as you see, we have two species. Well, most of the species were above, but we for the six species that we decided the fish, the six samples that were collected and sent for mercury analysis, they were taken specifically from Ichirang because they were the largest of the fish species. 
So those were the, and please, um, I, I don't know how to pronounce them properly, but the samples were the Cyclosoma bimaculatum, the Hoplirhinus unitaneus, the Crincyclosaxitalis, the Crincyclovalasi, Crincycla alta, and the Hoplius malabaricus. Now, the Crincycla and the Hoplirhinus, those had the highest concentrations of mercury, and that was because those were the largest fish samples that were collected. Okay, so we'll have to... So in conclusion, what we saw was that Tukai had the greatest species diversity and richness. Um, the highest abundance was found in Pataro. The Crincycla lugubre and they hope you're right. Mm -hmm. the, that one had the greatest mercury concentrations among the sites. And two kites was the only site where there was a relationship between water quality parameters and abundance. And the one thing I would like to mention is that with the, what I also found was that you cannot specifically say that the size had, uh, that the mercury concentration is, what is it? I wrote it up. Oh, because so mercury accumulates in the muscles, in the muscle tissues of the fish, which we know. And it's because of the diet that that's why these two fish had the highest concentration because they were omnivorous. One is an omnivorous fish species and the other one is a carnivorous species. So because of their diet, that is why even though, even though they're larger, they're not at the largest of the species that were collected, but it was their diet that contributed to the concentration of mercury. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you to our ladies. And now to introduce our one gentleman in this segment. I'm sure he's not the, uh, he's not shy to the field work as well. And I just wanna commend all the young ladies for doing that kind of field work and getting dirty with the crab. Props to you guys, and I'm sure y'all were not even 20 years old at the time when you were doing it. Props to you, young people. All right, so good afternoon, uh, everyone, all protocols observed. My name is Trumal Akra. I am a recent graduate of the University of Guyana, Department of Chemistry. And my undergraduate research title was the analysis of the mercury content in the hair of the residents of Corral. Now, mining plays a vital role in the uh, economical uh, lives of many Guyanese, uh, especially those in the indigenous community. Uh, so many persons in Guyana rely heavily on, on mining um, for their lively incomes. And many times what we see is that they overlook the uh, health impact of this because when it's all said and done, they need finances for their families. So many times they would overlook many of the health and safety responsibilities that come with mercury. So many persons put their lives on the line to earn a living in mining. All right, so the form of mercury that is found in here uh, is methyl mercury. And so mercury vapors uh, from different uh, plants and different uh, mining sites, they happen to get into the waters and small organic matters um, usually eat them and break them down and they turn into methyl mercury and then we have smaller fishes eat them and then fishes eat them and they continue to eat them and I recently just had fish for lunch which is really sweet so we humans then catch them and we have fish um, and so we have methyl mercury present in our body so as Miss would have mentioned earlier many of the mercury uh, go into these organic go into these uh, these organic matter and then they end up in humans and we'll see just now they end up even so in our here.
Uh, the objectives of this uh, research was to determine the concentration of the mercury in the hair of the residents of Kikorao um, and to compare that to the internationally accepted levels um, produced by WHO, which is 10 ppm. My research questions were, what are the mercury levels in the hair samples collected from the residents of Kikorao? And do the mercury hair levels of the residents of Kikorao fall within the internationally accepted levels of 10 ppm? Now, as stated, the study took place in Karao, and Karao is a beautiful village that lies on the mainland, um, and it's situated on the lower Mazaruni River. Uh, it has a population of 530 people, and they're of mixed race, but it's predominantly Amerindian. Now, Karao is headed by uh, Tushal, Mr. Shane Cornelius, and their main economic uh, pursuits are logging, mining, uh, raising poultry, producing cash crops, and ground crops and other small businesses. And you can get there by a beautiful four to five minutes boat ride from Bartica. You can get in to the village of Corral. All right, now this is the fun part of the research, the sample collection. Um, so most of our participants were females. So they were a little nervous at first because they were questioning my skills in as a barber, as how, how well can I cut the hair? Am I gonna leave any patches? So we had a bit of a rocky start uh, for a sample collection, um, many persons were hesitant, but as they but they later saw that you know I, I got a little skills in hair cutting. So we had fourteen participants, uh, mostly females uh, from the village, and the hair samples were taken from the scalp and were placed in sanitized Ziploc bags, which were sealed, labeled, and taken back to the university. Uh, the samples were cleaned, left to soak in a solution of acetone and distilled water for 15 minutes. And after washing the samples, they were then dried and chopped into smaller pieces for digestion. The samples were digested. Uh, sorry. The samples were digested using the Mar 6 microwave digester. Uh, so 0.2 grams of hair was added uh, to a digestion vessel with 10 mils of nitric acid and one mil of um, hydrogen peroxide, and this was digested for 40 minutes, after which I made up the samples in a 25 mil volumetric flask. The sample was analyzed using the flame atomic absorption spectrometer uh, with a cold vapor attachment. It, so the sample was, stannous chloride was used to break down the sample and then it was run through the VGA for mercury. Results. Now, the main concentration found uh, within the hair um, was 6.15 ppm. This falls within the accepted uh, limit of 10 ppm. However, it falls, it, it does not fall within the risk uh, level, which is 5 ppm. And we found that 57 participants measured over the risk limit, which is 5 ppm and 35 participants measured over the acceptable limit of 10 ppm. As it relates to male and female, we had the mean concentration were relatively the same, but the males had a slightly higher concentration of 6.5 um, mean average, while the females had a concentration of 6.1. There was a correlation study done between the time spent in the village as it as it relates to concentration, and we found that there was no statistical link between the two. Um, as is pointed out by the scatter graph, there was no statistical impact with the time spent in the village as it relates to concentration. For we found that persons who were there for only just nine months had elevated le ele elevated levels elevated levels of uh, methyl mercury. We also did a correlation to see if age had any factor to play within the concentration, but this as well showed no significant statistical significance um, as persons with different age ranges had various levels in their hair. Conclusion, from the data gathered, it can be concluded that the residents of Coral fall within the acceptable range of 10 ppm However, the mean 
However, 57 parties of the participants showed levels of mercury over the risk limit of 5 ppm and 35 showed levels over the accepted limit. So this study only had 14 participants. Um, so as a recommendation, there needs to be further studies to be done to be able to get uh, a stronger uh, statistical analysis um, as the data pool was a small amount. So there was not much uh, correlation that could have been linked to the study. Um, these are my references. And thank you for listening. Right. Thank you, Tramal. Um, and we just wanted to, as a co-supervisor on his project, I just wanted to make mention uh, quickly of two persons that helped us a lot in that study. I was Renee Edwards from CI, putting us in contact with Tushau and then Deshaun for logistical support. Thanks so much. See, together we can get it all done. So the next presenter is Ms. Cynthia Albert, and she wants to present on the stage. So we're going to remove this mic. Uh, we'll give her 10 minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, so this presentation will be focused on a knowledge, attitude, and practices survey of health effects associated with mercury among miners in artisanal and small scale gold mining in selected areas in Port Kaituma, which were Wallabaka and Eight Miles. All right, let me just test this out for All right, yes, this slide I need. So there has been a significant increase in mercury use in the ASGM sector, as according to the study by Watson and Gonzalez and some other writers in 2020. Also, the United Nations estimated that the ASGM sector in Guyana imports between 7.5 to 22.5 metric tons of mercury annually. Also, some miners are not aware of the health effects caused by mercury, which has resulted in them misusing it, as according to Hayes and Vera's study. However, as we move along in this presentation, we will see whether this statement was, well, the statement showed similar findings or it differ. Okay, further research objectives. One, the first objective was to determine the level of knowledge attitude and practices of artisanal and small scale miners on health effects associated with mercury in the two study areas. The second objective was to, de was to identify the determining factor for the attitude and practices of artisanal and small scale miners towards the health effects associated with mercury in Wallabaca and Eight Miles. While the third objective was to recommend measures on how to reduce the health effects associated with mercury in the ASGM operation. For the methodology, a mixed method approach was used for this study, which include a combination of both quantitative and qualitative data. So for quantitative data, I used questionnaires to survey the miners, while for the qualitative data, interviews were used to, um, do, to conduct interview with some key stakeholders like GGMC, Aurora Gold Mines, and even Small Miners Association. All right, so this is the results section. So in the questionnaire, there were five sections. 
Section A was based on socio-demographics, in which all minors were males. Section B was focused on knowledge, and from the knowledge, we can see that a 75.2% of minors were knowledgeable about the health effects caused by improper use of mercury. It ranged from digestion problems to shaky hands. On the section with attitude, no minors rate their attitude as excellent, but a significant amount rate it as good. So they had a good attitude, they claim, while the remainder said fair and satisfactory. In the attitude section continuing, I did a comparison of the educational attainment and the operations aim. So I did a cross tabulation to see whether if they're academically inclined, if it would have any effect on their aims when operating. And it showed that educational attainment didn't matter because only 9.5 said that they strive for a healthy workplace. So everybody else catered for a happy workforce. They also said productive workforce, and some of them responded economically sound workforce. On the practices session, these are two tables. This one was asked whether a retort was used in their operation, and the other if they used personal protective equipment while handling the mercury. And a scene sometimes was the highest recorded, which showed 49.7%. Sometimes they use a retort. And for PPE, a significant 72.7% claim that no, they don't use PPE. All right, I also assessed what they would recommend for the improper use of mercury, and 60% of them responded that provision of incentives to help miners gather necessary resources and further develop mercury management approaches will reduce unsafe practices in the ASGM operation. Also, after conducting interviews with key stakeholders, they expressed their commitment to ensuring a reduction in the health effects and an increase in awareness of these effects in the ASDM sector. The agency also recommended ways in which health effects in the ASDM sector can be reduced. Their responses vary, which include awareness, some said revision of policies, etc. So to conclude my presentation, in answering the objective, there was a good level of knowledge because miners were aware of the health effects associated with improper use of mercury. They had poor attitude and practices because they care less about PPE, they, care, they cared less about using a retort and other safety measure. Also, the, t the determining factor for attitude was basically salary scale since most of them responded that and the determining factor for practices was a lack of financial and technical resources due to the minors also better information dissemination revision of policies increased education awareness technical assistance and increased compliance was recommended for my recommendations Number one, I would recommend mercury-free technologies, also education and awareness definitely, access to finances, since some of the miners claim that they're not so accessible to certain finances to fund certain operations, and number four, revision of policies. Thank you for listening. These are my references.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sony Bowman. I did a Bachelor of Science, and this is my research. And this is my research topic and investigation of related occupational accidents from artisanal and small scale gold mining in Madia. Um, this morning, we had a lot of persons did their research and a lot had a lot to say about Madia as it were also. So, um, to justify the research, we know that the reason that led me to do this investigation is that while it is acknowledged that artisanal and small scale um, gold mining is a high risk industry with um, small scale miners leaning towards economic gains while they fail to adhere to good health and occupational safety guidelines, the prevalence of occupational accidents needs to be addressed to mitigate injuries and fatalities encountered in this um, w in artisanal and small scale gold mining, which led to my objectives. Um, the objectives were to determine the cause of occupational accidents associated with artisanal and small scale gold mining, um, to investigate the impacts of occupational mining accidents, and also to identify possible mechanisms to address such um, accidents in small scale gold mining. So my research questions were to align myself with the objectives, which were um, what are the causes of occupational accidents associated with ASGM? Um, what are the impacts of occupational accidents on small scale gold miners in the Madia area? And what are the possible mechanisms to address occupational mining accidents in artisanal and small scale gold mining? Um, the study area, I won't have much to say about it because we've been here about it all day. And it's the Madia area. The, the, on your, on your right there, there's a um, map of um, the cross-sectional area of Madia. It's mining district, mining district two, um, region number eight, Patara Supanuni area. So, um, continuing on the methodology, um, the instrument that was used was a questionnaire. Um, it's actually a cross-sectional study. Sorry. Yes, it's actually a cross-sectional um, research design which was used with a mixed method approach. Um, the cross-sectional research design allows for the capturing of data during a specific period and time. Um, concerning time, I had a lot of time constraints, so that would be one of the main limitations of this research. Um, the, instrument, the instrument used was a questionnaire um, the section A of the questionnaire is basically um, biodata, and the um, section B of the questionnaire was, um, was actually aligned to deal with the objectives of the research or the investigation, as it were. Um, so basically, my findings um, for section A of this investigation, it, the Figure on your figure three, which is on the left, it just shows that the um, the gender that predominantly um, was interviewed was males, um, and males was only accounted for seven percent. And on your right, it shows the age range, which being um, the blue, which was predominantly young persons. So um, that would actually help the industry in terms of persons being able to give um, a lot of years into um, mining as it were. Um, in figure five, which would be the beginning of, in figure, in figure five, we actually, um, it shows there that there are many miners new to the sector and um, simultaneously there are artisanal and small scale gold miners with relatively abundance of experience. So um, with those between two to five years, they were, um, 
I, I would say they're, they're not totally new to it, but they're getting the hang of it, um, which leads me to section B of the questionnaire, which was more tailored to the objectives, as I mentioned. Um, so in figure six, um, majority, this is the 7% operate in open pit mines, while 43% operate in dredging, which brings us to the data on, on the level of mechanic, um, which brings us to the data on the level of mechanization in artisanal and small scale gold mining. Um, figure seven, which is on the, on the right, um, shows um, the level of mechanization in artisanal and small scale gold mining, which um, with low mechanization, it emphasizes the labor intensiveness of the sector. Many of these miners do not um, possess the capital to transition over to mechanization and rely solely, and they rely solely on manual labor. Therefore, an increase in the requirement of manual labor maximizes the probability of um, occupational accidents. Um, for figure eight on the left, it shows that the, um, the majority of respondents in artisanal small-scale gold mining in Maya attribute to occupational accidents, which was due to um, heavy loads, the lack of mechanization, and, and manual labor. Um, also, in toxins and um, alcohol and drugs played a, a common part among this. Um, contributing to accidents, um, poor working conditions, collapsing of pit walls, and lack of training in safe practices, particularly mercury use, um, are also significant hazards. Uh, mercury contamination of water sources and fish releases, and fish release harmful traces, possessing environmental and health risks. Um, workplace violence and substance abuse are also common issues, which also minors consuming alcohol at home, but not on mining ground, leading to injuries. So a lot of them, when we say at home, it might not be exactly at where they, they're living because they live at the mining camps, a lot of them. But you find that when they're finished working, a lot of them would go to what we would call the landing and enjoy themselves for a period and then think that they could go back and function properly on the work ground. Um, and this points to hazards or risks, as it were, associated with artisanal small scale gold mining. Um, figure 10 shows, um, figure 10 there shows there that the, um, the majority of the, car, um, the respondents of artisanal and small scale gold mining in Madia attribute to occupational accidents, to heavy loads, as it were, lack of mechanization, and manual labor. Um, it's kind of like repetitive because we spoke about market contamination of water sources and fisheries and food traces. And so on the right, um, for figure 11, it shows that on a weekly basis, occupational accidents occur, and it was very common due to the lack of mechanization again, um, harsh conditions and increased involvement of minors, um, threatening their safety and this, the longevity of the, <laughs> of the sector. Um, for figure 12, the absence of rectification highlights the non the non-appearance of coping mechanisms to address the causes of occupational accidents associated with artisanal and small-scale gold mining in order, in order to reduce the occurrence of occupational accidents, the causes much to be addressed. Um, failure to address the causes will result in the reoccurrence of um, similar multiple occupational accidents. So over time, the lives of miners are at risk, threatening the sustainability of the sector. And on your right, figure 13, um, injuries, um, short-term injuries are, work, um, are workability and earning disruptions were 
on the or on the four were on the rise there at 43%. Mercury is in mining at um, contributes to environmental contamination, polluting water sources and causing harm to humans and marine life. This disrupts ecosystems and society balance. Yeah. So um, with all these findings tailored, um, there was some recommendations where um, ASGM should be prioritized as a high risk factor and um, the ministries, including Ministry of Health, Natural Resources, Labor, um, should prioritize outscaling natural public health interventions on counseling and raising awareness of the adverse impacts of ASGM that are not op um, operating under the right and um, appropriate ISO standards. And ASGM associations and ASGM minors are, and relevant stakeholders need to advocate for um, insurance insurance and social security for ASGM and Yano. So in conclusion, it is evident that the findings that majority of the workers associated with artisanal small scale gold mining in Mandia are males. Many of the miners are young with adequate experience hinting to the bright future of the sector. Um, the primary cause of the occupational accidents in related to the, is related to the handling of heavy tools. And this is credited to the low mechanization of the sector and poor working conditions in which miners operate on a daily basis. It is identified from the data collected that there is no reflection of the cause of occupational accidents associated with artisanal small scale gold mining in Madhya. Um, thereby miners are prone to occupational accidents when they operate. The uh, majority of impact of occupational accidents on miners are short term injuries. Um, this is a direct correlation between short-term, there's a direct correlation between short-term injuries and the contribution towards the loss of work days and disruption to earnings. Um, such majority of the respondents indicate the provision of financial aid to affect the miners and their families is most suitable as a possible coping mechanism. Thank you. All right, thank you. That was Tanya Bowman from the Department of Environmental Studies. So can I invite um, the five presenters up on stage? We'll have a very brief panel discussion, 10 minutes. Um, for anyone in the audience who would have questions, please prep them now. Let's put two more chairs. Thank you. So, audience, I know it's very sparse right now, but um, let's ask our, all of our wonderful presenters some, something or any comments. So, I just wanted to recognize that we went from some very hard science people to the, the more social science. Um, and so these are all undergrad students. I know when they did the project, they were undergrad students. So I think it's quite commendable um, the kinds of work that we are able to produce uh, from the University of Ghana, from our students. With Anybody had funding? Oh, okay, one person had funding. <laughs> um, okay, good. So there was some support um, for our, some of our students here on the stage. But, um, and then, Tony, you work with DGMC. So you were able to, to have access in that case to the site. Um, but yeah, just, just to say that. Ah, yes, yes. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rene Edwards. I work at Conservation International. So it's a general question to the presenters. Well, first of all, congratulations for great uh, presentations and very relevant research. So I think all of the research projects are very relevant um, in the sector. But there's a 
is less about the technical, it's a less technical question. It's more, uh, the question is related to your ability to engage with the communities that you work with. So either the indigenous communities or the mining community itself, the miners, uh, you, all of the research that you did it really related to problems that would emerge and affect communities. So it would be nice to hear from each one of you how you engaged the communities where you worked with and how this information could help these communities with their own decision making, uh, either if they are using it already or how you think they can use it. All right, so first off, I am from Region 1, Port Taituma, mainly. So while gathering research, it was easy for me, I would say, because I knew most of the miners them. So I did um, stakeholder involvement first with like the GM, and then I was able to get information from the miners directly. Um, concerning information dissemination, so after conducting the research, I didn't go back into the area as yet. So when I get back, be sure, rest assured, that I will have another stakeholder involvement with the GMs again, and then communicate with them the findings from my research, and from then we move forward. Hi, so my research was done such a long time ago, since 2018. And most of the information that we would have gathered, it was for the Protected Areas Commission and GGMC to use for their, for further um, research purposes. So most of my work is in their hands for them to share it, myself and Ms. Davis's, for them to share our information with the relevant stakeholders. But what I would suggest is that Sometimes we remove the persons that it's actually impacting from the conversation. Um, and instead of us, you know, coming together by ourselves and saying, oh, this is what we think you should do, this is it. You gotta ask, let them be involved in the conversation. We look out, we don't see anybody, any minors. So I think that's the next step for us, to invite minors to the conversation, see what they have to say about the mercury, see if they're actually being impacted and the, uh, the persons from the, re the air surrounding areas find out from them directly what is going on. So I guess that's where the, soci the social persons was coming, but those are just my thoughts. For my research, because it was in indigenous communities, I first um, reached out to the CDCs of the communities to conduct my surveys. Um, fortunately for me, I had 90% of my team was indigenous citizen science youth of the area. So it was them teaching me how to catch crabs, which went well. Um, and then once I gathered my data, I taught them how to analyze this data, which is something that they're not really um, used to. Um, persons would go and conduct researches and then leave with that data, but I stayed I showed them how to analyze the data. When I came out back and I had my presentation, I went in back to the community and I shared my presentation and my findings with them. And they did share some feedback. They did say when they eat a certain crab, they do start to get headaches and they start to feel nauseous. And from that exchange, I am now what they call in my organization, the crab girl. So I want to pursue more studies on crabs and I want to do it in the area because it's a mangrove ecosystem. It's, bi it's biodiversity rich, but everyone focuses on fishes and the mammals, but I want to do the crabs because it's important to the diet and the income of the people. Well, working with GGMC, I find it easy to interact with miners since the uniform gives me a lot of power in the interior. <laughs> Um, but that power is only good if you use it for good. And as long as I'm telling them I'm not there to like shut down your operations or anything, it makes it way easier to talk to them. So um, while doing the questionnaires and everything, I find it easier to talk to them 
and to interact with them. And for me, it was just an investigation to know what they have to say and what really causes these, um, these injuries. I didn't really focus on fatalities that much. But I mean, every week or it's very often that you would always find in the papers or in the headlines that a minor lost his life, a pit cave in and something. And it's, it's really this time to know that I'm part of the industry, I'm part, I'm part of the, in the, the enforcement team. And so to actually help protect these minors, but it's not that they don't see or they don't understand or they don't know the risk but it's like they're always just willing to take that risk, looking or thinking that they can make it big. So um, it's a lot of work. It's continuous work. And I don't think it's just, just implementing policies, but you got to keep enforcing them. And I guess that's what GGMC, along with other, um, all these other um, ministries and so are there to do the offices. As it relates to my research and sampling, I must first say a great uh, congratulations to Mr. Cornelius. Uh, he's a very progressive-minded Tushau. So, you know, he was relaying with me before I even got to the village, you know, what do I need, etc. So when I arrived at the village, everyone was already, most of the persons uh, were aware and they started to assemble um, at the village office. So I would say that my interactions with the with the, with the residents uh, was very good um, because the Tushau made sure that they understood the importance of uh, the analysis and the results there in um Now the people, they were aware, uh, which I was happy to see that they were aware of the, the dangers of dealing with mercury. Um, so they asked so many questions as to what they can do, et cetera. And of course I would have told them that after the analysis, I would, you know, kind of make a specific recommendations. So they were very aware and there was, even a concern for one of the um, one of the residents had drunk some metal mercury um, as, as well. Um, so, and we had a very concerned mother who was, you know, wanting to know what to, what she could do, etc. Sadly, I did not get to get a sample from from that villager because she was not there at the time. Um, but I loved the fact that the villagers were aware of the dangers and they were very willing and ready to, you know, participate to get the results. As it relates to recommendations, as I wrote up my findings in their personal letters, as well as the general report for the Tushau and the others, I would have made specific rec recommendations as it relates um, to, because many women there were working in the mining fields as it relates to dealing with the mercury, as well as diet and other things that they can do. So I think that due to the great leadership of the, the Tushau, um, sampling for me was great and interactions with them were it's like they've known me already for a long time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for presenting your work. And I'm happy to be here to hear from, you know, the results that you've um, found um, and the work that you've put in. Uh, can you say how long you've spent, um, all of you, how long you've spent in the field or in the community to so doing your work and how you found it? Um, taking the other side, not so much in terms of the interaction with people, but just how you found it, but also whether, um, well, at least two of you are working in the field um, that you're doing, but if others are, uh, will continue to do so. And Tanya, I wanted to know, I don't think, I saw it. What's the sample size for you? Um, I can't remember if I saw it in your in your presentation. All right. So the time frame for me, it was approximately three months. I took to gather information. Okay, and how was the experience? Well, it was a bit stressful indeed because I had to in, um, I had to survey like 106 to five miners, so that was a lot, you know, going and then coming, and then sometimes they may, they might be at work, so then you can't get certain information. Then then you have to go and you have to return again. So it was a bit stressful for me, but all in all, I did the research and I gathered information. 
Uh, so for my research, we spent 10 days out at Kaichur National Park, and it was my first time going there, and it was, I enjoyed myself. I don't know, I'm an outside, I'm an outside person, I like being outside. So I enjoyed myself. Yeah, there were, you know, when you're in the, when you're in the area and the, the persons will tell you, oh, they get this folklore and this folklore, and if you hear the monkey calling, you must go, and all sort of thing. But, you know, all of that was a part of the experience, and I really enjoyed myself. And presently, I'm working in the water quality lab of the hydromet service, so I'm still in the field where I'm able to go out and get the experience. My research took two weeks in the field. Um, it was my first time in the field, first time in Region 1. And it was a big step for me. It was me going from a city girl to a bush girl. But I must say, um, two years, um, sorry, a year later, I am still working in the area with the Ghana Marine Conservation Society and my role as the organization allows me to continue to trek the mangrove forest with my citizen science and i must say that i am here today but my citizen science are currently in the mangrove forest retrieving camera traps that we set a few months back so my sample size i limited to a hundred um a hundred persons minors in the area and um Madia is like home, I must say. Mom was born at 111 miles, Madia Pataro. So being there is, I'm welcomed by the Highlander community a lot there since that's her side of the family. So I don't have a problem being there at any point in time. Um, I spent approximately two weeks up there gathering information. And it extended a bit, but it would have been in tongue once I know a miner from up that side. I would um, actually get them to converse with me right in the office. So I had a mixture of both. Uh, I would say that my experience was uh, extremely enriching. Uh, it started with the drive to get to Bartik to get the boat and that we used the trail and that took hours and hours and we saw monkeys and snakes and all different things. Um, so that was very enriching. My sampling time took roughly three hours, so that was pretty quick in, snip the hair, and I was uh, back out to get the samples to the university lab, but the experience of traveling through the trails and seeing the wildlife of Guyana was very enriching. I currently work in the analytical field of chemistry, um, so I don't do a lot of field work. Um, however, I'm at the stage where uh, our company has brought in a lot of new first-time equipment for these analysis to Guyana, so I'm looking to engage my uh, bosses to see how they can collaborate with the university to use these much needed instruments to bring better quality analysis. Thank you. All right, so very quickly, a question from online. Uh, Dillon Earl asked, uh, in, I think it's from his hope. Um, <coughs> it says, it was mentioned that mercury content in the larger fishes may have been related to their diet. Was there a major difference between the herbivore and carnivore fish in terms of concentration of mercury? Uh, honestly, let me see. I have to take my mind back five years. Um, no, well, if there was a major difference, yeah. Well, we did not, okay, we did not send samples for herbivora. Um, fish. We only sent samples for the carnivorous and the omnivorous because those were the larger sizes. So the herbiv herbivorous fishes were very tiny and you can't get the 100 gram sample that you would need. So that's why we were only, we had to take from the larger fishes and they, those fall into those two categories. So. I won't be able to properly answer the question because we did not venture to that side. Thank you. Last question? Let's keep the question short. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Shamiza Tom, GGMC. 
to me to Tom GGMC. Just um, add to the question the person asked. Um, more than likely, herbivorous fishes would have a less mercury content than carnivorous or omnivorous fishes um, because of the fact that mercury bioaccumulates. So every fish that eats a fish that contains mercury retains the mercury of the fish that it eats. So that makes it um, that makes carnivorous and omnivorous fishes that would have a higher mercury content than a herbivorous fish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please give all of our presenters a round of applause. And we hope to see um, some more stellar work coming from you guys and research in this area. So I can't believe I'm still cheering. <laughs> Elford. I feel like I've been here forever. Anyways, we're down to our last two that I'm going to be sharing, the last two findings presentation. Um, we have, uh, these are not students anymore. Um, we have Ms. Bibi Amin, a uh, GIS analyst from the Ghana Forestry Commission. And then we'll also have Mr. Stefan Monsami, as a lecturer in the Department of Environmental Sciences in the Faculty of Earth and Environmental Sciences. So let's go with Ms. Amin first. You both, we have 15 minutes each on our schedule, um, and then we'll have a question and answer segment. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Unfortunately, my colleague, Ms. Amin, could not be here today, so I'll be doing the presentation for her. My name is Rihanna Abdul Kadir, and I'm a GIS and remote sensing analyst at the Ghana Forestry Commission. Now, over the course of the morning and the afternoon, we've been hearing a lot of presentations speaking to, you know, the impact of mercury and mining on human health and the environment. However, my presentation is very different. I, I, I'll only be speaking on how this mining is mapped in Guyana. So my presentation is entitled Forest Cover Mapping in Guyana with a specific focus on mining. So I'll be explaining how Guyana Forestry Commission maps deforestation of mining in Guyana. Okay. So to give us a bit of background information, as you know, Guyana is a developing country with a relatively low population of approximately, okay, Guyana is, thank you. Can I get it? Okay, so Guyana is a developing country with a relatively low population of approximately 756,000 people and majority of our population reside on the coastal region. We have an approximate total area of 21.1 million hectares, and of this, approximately 85% is forested, and this forest is mostly inaccessible. Okay, so as the Guyana Forestry Commission, our mapping unit, as it's referred to, we map deforestation throughout the entire country, and we use we presently use both Landsat and Sentinel imagery, and they have respective resolutions of 30 meters and 10 meters. We briefly use rapid eye technology between 2011 to 14. However, it was phased out due to the high cost we were paying. So Sentinel image were the Sentinel imagery was cheaper, and it did the same the same thing as the rapid eye. So we currently use Landsat and Sentinel imagery to map. So these are a few key definitions and parameters that govern the work that we do. And the main definition is deforestation. Now we define deforestation as the conversion from forest cover to non-forest cover. And one of the major parameters that govern our mapping work is the MMU or the minimum mapping unit. And this is one hectare. What this means is that if we see a change on the sentinel imagery, we have to measure that that area, and unless it's a hectare or more, then it's mapped as deforestation. 
and we use a mapping scale of 1 to 10,000. So as I define deforestation as the conversion from forest cover to non-forest cover, we have to look at some of the major drivers of deforestation in Guyana. So these include mining, infrastructure, forestry, mining roads, permanent agriculture, and fire. Now of this list, the leading driver of deforestation in Guyana is mining. So what is our mapping approach? We divide the, the entire Guyana into 24 km by 24 km tiles, and then these tiles are further divided into 1 km grids. We also use sentinel imagery from the previous year, the previous mapping year, in tandem with the current mapping year. And this is to ensure that we have a comparison between what was the existing environment and what is presently happening. So we get to compare and contrast to see, okay, do we have deforestation this year? Is it mining? And if a change is noted, as I mentioned, we measure this, once it's a hectare or more, we then map this change, we digitize it, we draw a polygon around it, and this change is then attributed. So we use a specialized or customized toolbar to attribute this change. If you look at the top right, it's a small screenshot, but it shows the map attribution table. Now we need four key pieces of information when attributing a change. We need the start source, and that is simply the image that shows the existing condition before that change occurred. We use the end source. The end source is the sentinel image where the change has occurred, where you see in some form of deforestation. We need the driver. In this example, the driver will be mining, and we need the end land use class. And mining goes to, when you're mapping mining, the end land use class goes to bare land. So this simply shows our analyst mapping blocks. So when we're, as I mentioned, we're dividing Guyana into 24 km by 24 km tiles. So the little squares we're seeing, those are the tiles. So we divide these tiles equally amongst our GIS analysts, and this is to ensure that you know, there's a fair distribution, because Guyana has a sort of mapping region where it's prevalent, so we don't want one analyst to end up with the heavy mapping tiles, you know, and they're spending hours trying to map all of the changes. So we randomly distribute these styles among our analysts. We also have project tracking. So when we're finished mapping all of the changes within a tile, we would update a spreadsheet to indicate that this tile is finished. This is to ensure that we keep track of which tiles are already mapped and which are outstanding. So the Excel sheet is then converted into this project tracking shape file that we see here. This simply shows what I've been speaking of. The squares we're seeing, that's the 24 km by 24 km tiles that each analyst is working on then. You know, we divide these equally. And as you can see, we're seeing some changes mapped there with different colors. Some are in green, some are in purple, pink. These simply mean different periods or mapping years. So this guides us because we can see, okay, if green is 2013, then this change has occurred in 2013. Or if purple is 2022, then this is a more recent change. So how is change detection mapped? As I was mention, mentioning before, when we're mapping mining, we use imagery from the present year and imagery from previous years. So for example, if our present year is year 11, what we're seeing on the right, then we have to use imagery from the year before, which is year 10. Okay, so in year 10, we're seeing the polygon drawn. Now in the polygon, we can see that, yeah, the image on the left. In the polygon, we can see that that region is still forested. It hasn't been deforested. However, when we look at year 11, we can see that inside the polygon, it's no longer forested. So we would map that change on the right as mining. We would map this as mining based on the spectral footprint that we're seeing. This is how mining shows up on a sentinel image. You can see that it looks like a sort of darker pool of water. So we look for that to map it as mining. We also look at the existing environment in the year before, because taking us back to year 10 on the left, if we look just around that polygon, we can see some form of mining has already started in that area. And so by year 11, we could also be informed that this mining has expanded. This is also where our reference data sets come into play. 
Now, at the Ghana Forestry Commission, we are big on data sharing. We not only share our data sets, but we receive data sets from sister agencies such as Ghana Geology and Mines Commission, Protected Areas Commission, Ghana Lands and Surveys Commission. So this is where we receive a data set from the Ghana Geology and Mines Commission, and we overlay this data set onto our mapping work. We can be able to see if this region is a mining area or some form of mining concession is here. So this would also inform our decision to map this change as mining. So these are some of our post-processing and quality control steps. When all of the changes have been mapped within each of the tiles by the GIS analyst, our QC analyst or quality control analyst would review our work to ensure that no overlaps are occurring, to ensure that the correct attribution has been given to the work that we've mapped. So if we map something as mining, our QC analyst would review to make sure that that change is indeed mining. They also ensure that all of the attribution fields are properly filled, for example, driver and the inland use class. When they're finished vetting all of the GIS analyst work, they then stitch all of the changes together to create a master all change layer. So this is an example of how the attribution table looks for the entire country. This is just a snippet, because remember, mapping changes for the entire Guiana. So when they stitch together all of the work that the GIS analysts have done, they have this master attribution table. This master layer is then run through a GIS model using ArcGIS Pro. And what this model does is that it ensures all of the stuff that has been mapped, it ensures that the correct attribution has been added to it, it ensures that these changes have a land cover and a land class attributed, attributed to it. This GIS model then creates an Excel model. And the Excel model is simply an Excel sheet that has a breakdown of all of the changes that we've mapped, all of the deforestation for Guiana. And now this is the most important part, you know, all of the work that we've been doing. It's really to get these final deforestation numbers because that is what is used to create the annual MRVS, Monitoring Reporting Verification System, so the annual MRVS report for Guyana. And as we know, this report influences the payment that our country receives from Norway to keep our forests intact. This data set is also shared among other agencies, and that simply summarizes the work that we do at the Guyana Forestry Commission to map mining and map deforestation in Guyana. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Abdul Qadir. I got the name right this time, I hope. Uh, so let's move next to, um, we have a lecturer in the Department um, of Earth and Environmental Sciences, Mr. Stefan Monsami. You have uh, 15 minutes for your presentation. All right, thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. So I think the, this presentation um, essentially is in a good place in today's schedule as it really encapsulates everybody's discussion here today. And we'll be presenting it within a policy framework. And when we look at the mining sector, a lot of the discussion today has been on the mercury issue and environmental health issues related to um, gold mining. But we have to also recognize that mining is an pertinent economic sector. And it's an economic sector that is infused with Guyana's society, Guyana's culture, and Guyana's ecological space. So within that, what, we really, what I'm going to present here today is looking at a framework for sustainability. And what we did we use the Sustainable Development Goals as that framework to assess the policy environment for the artisanal small-scale gold mining sector within Guyana. So I am presenting this on behalf of my um, colleague, Dr. Timothy Liang, who is at the University of Brighton. And we co-authored this paper a couple of years ago. And he came up with this concept whereby we look at the SDGs. And the SDGs present a set of targets 
that a country is trying to achieve. And we often look at the SDGs in a very holistic standpoint. The country has to achieve it. But all the recognizing that those SDGs have mechanisms within each sector. It is not the country itself will achieve the SDGs. It's the collective action of each economic sector in the country and how they operate will ensure that that country achieves the SDGs. So based on that principle, we wanted to take a look at how the mining sector, the small-scale gold mining sector, contributes to the country achieving those SDG targets. All right, so, like I said, we often view these SDGs as a holistic benchmark, and all of the SDGs, the 17 SDGs, are aligned with the three spheres of sustainability, which is social, economic, and the environmental sphere. So, as I was stating, for us to actually achieve those SDG targets, each economic sector within the country needs to comply and needs to have the policy environment to achieve the SDG targets. So that's the backdrop of this study. So what we did, we utilized the SDG as a framework for assessing sustainability issues within the ESGM sector in Guyana. And this essentially, how what we are assessing is how current operations, culture, and the policy environment for the ESGM sector in Guyana, how is that contributing to Guyana's achievement of the SDG targets? So, like I said, we all may be familiar with 17 SDG targets. Now, the challenge of using the SDGs as a framework is that the SDGs are not polarized, right? Each target has overlapping issues. So, for instance, if you talk about deforestation, Deforestation can be an issue that goes under climate action, which is SDG 13, but it can also be an issue that goes under life on land, which is SDG 15. So that's one issue that overlaps between two SDG targets. So for us to, uh, have to also be able to filter the issues with overlapping SDG targets, so what we did, we looked at the SDGs and mapped it related to social issues, SDGs related to economic growth, and then the SDGs that were related to the environment. So this is our essential mapping of those SDGs. And yes, we still would have highlighted some of the overlapping issues. So certain issues like mercury, pol uh, mercury pollution, for instance, that will occur in multiple SDGs as an issue, as, um, as hindering achieving SDG targets. And I will show what that means by that. Right? So our methodology, what we did, we conducted a comprehensive narrative review of all accessible reports for the ESGM sector in Guyana. And we synthesized the reports to identify issues that either promoted an SDG or inhibited it. And we mapped the SDGs with information found in reports to see how each SDG is impacted by the artisanal small scale gold mining sector. So I'll just provide some basic um, overview of our results. So here are the different SDG targets. So for SDG 1, the SGM sector has positively contributed to livelihood through employment. Um, you're not seeing it there, but the left column is positive impacts and the right column is negative impacts. All right? So the contribution to livelihood and employment has reduced the incidence of no poverty. So it has a contributed positively to that SDG target. For zero hunger, on the other hand, the SGM sector has had negative impacts on agricultural lands within the interior. And that, as such, will reduce towards the contribution of food security within the country. All right? For good health and well-being, there has been negative impacts around the culture of gold mining within the interior. And I say in the culture of gold mining, because what we would have seen, we would have seen issues such as HIV and STDs occurring within the mining sector. All right? But we also see, we, we also see issues of um, impacts of mercury, which has now become a cultural practice within the mining sector as well. But in addition to that, because of where the mining locations, localities are, 
Um, you also see the prevalence of infectious diseases such as malaria and other mosquito, mosquito borne diseases. So there has been some negative impacts towards the health and well being targets um, of the SDGs. Quality of education, right? This actually is as a result of the multiplier effect from the ASGM sector. There is a negative connotation of the ASGM sector to education, and I will discuss that later on, right? But when you look at the revenue generated, the royalties generated from the, mine, the gold mining sector, that would have supported the educational development across Guyana. So we put that as a positive contribution in terms of quality education. Gender equality. We have seen in the report an increase in gender equality and employment opportunities between men and women within the mining sector. All right? Looking at the number of women within the um, workforce and so on. But on the other hand, we have also seen several reports on human trafficking and sexual exploitation of indigenous women, which creates a significant gender policy issue. Clean water and sanitation, which I believe have been spoken on length today as it relates to water pollution, especially impacting portable water sources. Affordable and clean energy. This was an SDG target that's really difficult to assess for the mining sector because it's really looking at what sectors contribute to renewable energy. So unless we have renewable energy sources for mining operations, the only thing we can see is a positive impact as the resource rents from the mining sector can contribute towards the investment in renewable energy nationally, right? Decent work and economic growth. So there are significant employment opportunities and the mining, um, that is in a small scale gold mining sector has been a significant contributor to foreign exchange. And that has a multiplier effect. So that foreign exchange has done a lot in terms of development within the Guyana's um, economic space, right? But on the other hand, there is a lot of illegal and illicit livelihood activities around the mining areas. Again, through that culture of mining, there is now a lot of illegal activities going on there as well, such as prostitution, smuggling. And there was a couple of presentations today that spoke about um, improper health and safety standards, which again compromises on the decent work aspect of that SDG. Right? Industry innovation and infrastructure. Um, the mining sector has contributed to the interior road infrastructure, but it has also impacted the interior road infrastructure. All right, I've actually read recently went to Rockstone and we saw the villagers in Rockstone barricade the entire trail because of the number of trucks that was coming out was so damaging to the road and they were having a serious issue with it. So um, it, it's contributing but also in, in, impacting the same infrastructure. All right. Reduced inequalities. One of the good things about the ESGM sector is that it provides a lot of employment opportunities, particularly for unskilled workers and workers within rural communities. So it's opening up rural communities with a lot more employment opportunities that can give a substantive livelihood. Um, again, through the multiplier effect, which is from the revenues generated, Revenues from the mining sector and the royalties and taxes paid from the mining sector has contributed to a lot of the infrastructural development we see along the coastline. So that is, we would see a positive contribution towards the SDG 11. And for the final set, responsible consumption and production. What we have observed is that within the mining sector, um, within the small scale gold mining sector, there's issues of sustainable production particularly driven by resource conflicts, and I like to reference the legislative perspective of resource underground versus the resource above ground, which one is given priority, right? And then, of course, we have the, had the conversation on mercury pollution as well, which is an unsustainable production practice, right? And then for the SDGs that are predominantly related to the environment, unfortunately, all of it is negative. Climate action, life below water, and life on land Right, the ASGM sector has negatively contributed to these particular dimensions. Yeah, as the ASGM sector is, was observed and in the report shown um, as the leading cause of deforestation within Guyana, and as such, that will impact the net carbon, um, the net carbon um, issue for Guyana. Additionally, aquatic biodiversity and river ecosystems impacted by mercury pollution, which was thoroughly emphasized today. 
and then deforestation and fragmented habitat as a result of mining clearing areas, which tend to disrupt um, species migration corridors, especially for the large cats that's in the um, interior. All right. Um, there's also on this issues with soil quality, as mining, dredging, and so on often tend to compromise subsoil quality and will lead to a lot of erosion as well. And then finally, for SDG 16, all right, um, the ASM mining areas has actually became a large illegal corridor for a lot of criminal activities. So we are seeing a lot of injustices and disruption of the peace happening within the corridors, especially for unregulated ASDM um, operations. So let's uh, give some of the salient findings. So from the economic dimension, the, um, sorry, from the environmental dimension, the ASDM sector is the leading cause of deforestation in Guyana. Um, the proliferation of use of mercury use is impacting biodiversity and indigenous communities. Um, the ESGM sector operation significantly compromises subsoil quality and erosion, which again can impact agriculture within the interior. And thus far, we have not seen any reports um, in the study that showed any positive impacts to the environment. Right. From the economic dimension, the SGM sector has positively contributed to the country's economic outlook. Revenues generated from the sector has contributed to numerous developmental projects in the country. Um, it has been a stable source of income and employment, especially within the hinterland areas. And though we have shown the positive economic aspects, what was very surprising is that there are challenges in regulating and monitoring the sector, which has actually resulted in significant economic losses from the sector. Um, our, our estimates look at sort of the ESGM sector probably contributes to about 500 million US dollars in revenue a year. But what is not known, little is known, that actually 1.5 billion US dollars is being smuggled to the borders with Brazil and Venezuela. So there's actually significant economic losses because of the challenges in monitoring and regulating, especially illegal and unregulated ESGM operations. And from a social dimension, quite a few interesting findings. The unregulated operations are a major corridor for drug smuggling, human trafficking, gang movements, and mineral smuggling. All right? And that is because of where it's, where it's located. It's very hard for law enforcement to monitor. All right? And as such, because once there's low law enforcement, there's going to be high criminal activity. There are negative social and cultural issues reported, including sexual exploitation of indigenous women, hinterland school dropout, so that's the negative aspect of education. I actually heard persons in the interior say, why, why, why they go and study in school when they could go and work in the mines? Right? And they have a high hinterland school dropout as persons prefer to go and work in mines rather than complete their education. Right? And very, let's say I'm not a very major, but it can be a, a, a sort more of a social issue, is that there's family instability. And I saw one of the student presentations reference this earlier. As mining workers would stay away from the homes, the households, for extended period of time, and that could put some social and psychological strain on the family dynamics. Right? It has actually been a significant contributor of the movement of HIV and other STDs sorry, up, from the hinterland to the coastland and vice versa. And we've seen substance abuse and mining areas, and then, of course, the poor health and safety standards. One of the things I want to recommend is that we need to look at the feasibility of the, of the, of the mining sector and to also better capture the feasibility, not just look at the economic prospect, but we need to start to do more research on the social and environmental costs associated with the ESGM sector. 
So that could be a point of area that we look at research that provides more comprehensive economic feasibility assessment that captures those external costs. So with that, I would just like to thank you all very much for your time and attention, and I'll entertain any questions. Uh, can I invite Ms. Uh, Abdul Qadir as well? Uh, we'll have a brief 10-minute um, uh, question and answer. So please uh, gear up those questions for us, for our panelists, I should say. <laughs> I have one to start. Um, if I'm going to abuse my, my role as chair. So this is from Ms. Munsami. Um, under, I believe it's SDG, SDG 2, Zero Hunger, yeah. um, you mentioned um, something about agricultural land being um, foregone. Was there any specific example or any specific case where you guys found land conflicts between agriculture and gold mining, particularly in Guyana? Oh, there are, there are many, many cases of agriculture and, and gold mining conflicts and you know it, it goes back to some of it can even go back to as far as to what is the the indigenous acts when it comes to indigenous communities who has priority over the resources and i believe the act states that within indigenous lands the indigenous communities have rights to the resources above the ground but the resources below the ground still belong to the state and there is a natural source of conflict so when you have agricultural lands and indigenous communities, the minerals tend to get priority. And therefore, again, those particular regulatory issues and those particular policy issues can drive these sorts of conflicts and that then contributes indirectly to the contribution of food insecurity. Yeah, thanks. So I asked, um, because like, I know when we go to many of the mining areas, people are not really interested in, in farming and all that. We, we saw it happening in Madia. There was um, Heinz Farm, I think Rochelle mentioned that. But anyhow, I wanted to also kind of um, reflect back on the zero hunger aspect of, your, um, of, of the SDD and the fact that we saw some presentations where fish, you know, many of the, um, the fish species that some of our students that projects on, we found high levels of mercury. So perhaps we can also think of it as a, a food safety issue under zero hunger as well. Um, you know, those, those impacts. Anyhow, any? Thank you for the presentation. I'm glad the two of you are sitting together. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Monsami, the, how, do you have any quantifiable measurement for, for the negative impacts? Um, I asked because I was looking at the SDG uh, life on land and climate, I believe, and the mention of deforestation and uh, as a negative impact, of course, from, from, from mining. However, I was wondering whether, considering the, the while mining has um, contributes to the highest um, deforestation in Guyana, um, the rate of deforestation overall for Guyana is seen as low. And I'm just checking to see whether you've quantified the measurements in terms of negative and uh, in any way in terms of your methodology and analysis. I'm not sure if I'm clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah? actually, um, I mean, I couldn't um, include all of that information in the presentation, right? Um, but we, we attempted to try and quantify what we can based on the reports and quantifying databases that we had access. So for instance, um, in, in, this, in the reports and in other studies I've done, I recognize that Guyana's deforestation is not really a major challenge compared to some other Latin American countries like Brazil, for instance. Um, it's like around 1%, which is really good. Um, but you know, we still needed to kind of hi highlight that it's still a negative impact regardless of it. And um, what I actually did to quantify it, I use an economic instrument. Um, and there's a, there's a uh, paper, a database that was developed by Robert Costanza that looks at um, the value of ecosystem services and they would have given a value per hectare for tropical rainforest. So based on the estimates we've seen in the reports, we would have used that to kind of give a proxy estimate as to what is the economic loss of the, of the forest area due to, um, to mining. Right, 
So uh, two questions separately on the GSC bit. I was wondering about uh, whether the monitoring is entirely uh, just uh, passive for the record, or is there um, sort of any kind of sensitization? When you, when you have uh, a, a discovery of deforestation related to mining in an area that is perhaps designated for mining, um, do you correlate that back with uh, GGMC uh, to determine whether they're aware of active mining in that area um, to make sure that you know, you're able to capture illegal activities? Is there that kind of a collaboration across the two agencies? That's my question for you. And if I hold you thing and, and um, here's the Stefan. Um, I wonder, the bit on, on environment, I, I wonder to ask similar question to what I was asking, but I, I wondered about the level of detail to which you were going. Uh, because I was curious about the bit on education and, and if we can directly, we are able to directly link an increase in mining activity and the revenue from it to improved education. So we know that the, the revenue increases, but does that revenue get linked to education both at the national level and at the level of the household? Does a miner who's earning more money take that money and spend it on education of themselves or the next generation. That's what I was wondering about. Okay, so for the correlations, like if we actually report back to GGMC, so most of the mapping that we do, the mining that we, you know, notice, most of them fall within mining concessions. So wherever we are noticing more and more as the years go on, more illegal mining activity then, you know, along the riverine regions because when you overlay it with the data sets we receive from GTMC and we see that they don't fall within concessions, we do relay information to GTMC to, you know, ask, do these people have permits, you know, what's happening here? And then if we see an alarming amount, you know, based on the hectares, you know, if it surpasses X amount of hectares, then that would be reported. But we're constantly sharing information. Data sets are always being, you know, updated and upgraded so that you could have some sort of, you know, awareness, like, okay, this is getting out of control. These people don't have permits. So as far as I know, we do relay that information to GGMC and then maybe the GGMC workers could speak to, you know, how they actually go into the regions and investigate who is illegally mining. Okay, so as it relates to education, from a national standpoint, although we didn't have uh, any sort of direct empirical evidence to link it, you can see from the, the quality and level of training that exists for mining skilled workers, mining, skilled workers in the mining sector. I mean, you look at the um, Guyana School of Mining, you're looking at the, the mining programs that the University of Ghana offers. You look at the training that the GGMC offers. And that you see that the, these trainings evolve as a result of the sector driving the need for skilled workers. So you can see the linkage there, right? That the, because economic sectors would drive educational curriculum to fit the needs of the sector. And that's where the mining sector would have contributed to that. So, when you look at you know, Guyana's skill training for mining compared to other countries that have mining, like in the African countries, it's far, it's far superior, right? But from the community standpoint, it then goes to the individual household's perspective on education. Because Erica would have stated, some households would say, you know, why send them to school where they could just go and get work in the mine and mine the household? But then miners would then who choose to send their children to school. Mining and the income earned from the mining sectors would then buy the books, the uniforms, the food, and so on. So there's that from that perspective as well that it contributes there from the household level. But at the community level, it then it, it all depends on the household's perspective on whether or not they want to pursue education as a course of action. Yeah, thank you. Both fascinating uh, presentations. I had uh, questions for, for both of you. One, um, Stephanie, if I could go first. And it's really related to the questions about Aisha and uh, Calvin asking. Um, so I assume, I haven't not read the paper, I'm assuming that your analysis was an aggregation no, at the national level. Yes. 
So I was wondering how you're taking into consideration localities in terms of the cost and benefit of, benefits of mining, oh, I guess, that, you know, related to the SDGs. Because one of the issues we obviously face in Guyana, if you're working in mining area, areas, you'll realize that places like Madia, Port Kaituma, Peruni, um, those areas where the resources, you know, the landscapes broadly, where the resources are being extracted, those areas are actually, the value isn't retained there, you know, the, the, the actual economic, um, social, and other values. If you look at all sorts of outcomes, development outcomes. So it'll be good to know, I have, I have not read the paper, how are you dealing with this, uh, you know, ag aggregation at a macro level, uh, given the fact that mining is happening at a particular micro level? So you can go first. All right. All right, thank you for that question. Um, within, the, within the sphere of this paper, what we really wanted to present was a framework that could identify policy areas, which is essentially the concluding slide. Um, we, we look at, okay, these are areas that can be prioritized with respect to policy intervention. Now, one of the things I would have presented there on the slide as well is the nexus of research. We did this at an aggregated understanding, as you would have highlighted. Right? And, but these issues will have a very unique dimension for each locality you go to. Right? Um, so this here provides now a framework for numerous disaggregated research. I have taken on one MSc student in the upcoming year to look at the issue of SDG 3 and SDG 7 within specific communities to kind of disaggregate the information. But I mean, this, is, this kind of research is going to be it's, it's enormous. There's a 17, 16 SDGs. The SDG 17 isn't really relevant, but the 16 SDGs and each SDG can be assessed at the community level. So it's, it's really, this paper is really to kind of set a benchmark of a research agenda that we can pursue to see now how at each at the community level, what are the issues with respect to achieving the individual SDGs. Yeah, thank you for that. Just a quick comment and that we're about to do some work with Tim on looking at uh, estimating the cost and benefits of mining using mercury and mercury-free mining. So mercury, mercury circuits that use mercury and circuits that don't use mercury. So we definitely would be reaching out I, to you to, to I had talk a, I had that. a conversation with him as well. Um, we, we're looking at, we want to do another scientific paper looking at to see if, there's, if there are ways where we can have sustainable prospecting and whether sustainable prospecting can reduce deforestation, all right? So we, have, we started to have those sorts of conversation about how in ways we can help, uh, what are sort of the policy mechanisms and information that we need to help achieve some of the SDG targets. Sorry, I'm in a bit. Thank you very much. Are we going to close this session? Thank you very much to uh, Stefan. Um, thank you. Right, so just uh, we're quite a bit now. Uh, they uh, offer schedule. We're trying to um, not uh, stretch the session too far beyond the, the scheduled close time. So we have one session left. The session chair is here. We indicate on the um, <coughs> schedule, on the agenda, that we'll have a working uh, coffee break. Nature of the working coffee break. It, 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 we take 10 minutes so that everybody can get a stretch their legs, grab a box of snack, grab something to drink, uh, use the washroom if you need to, whatever, within the 10 minutes, and just come back to the seats. You can eat and drink in the seats, and we'll have, um, I'm sure the presenters will not, uh, be, be uh, you know, put off by you eating while they're talking. Um, so uh, we're going to take that, that 10 minute break now, uh, washroom, food, drink, whatever, come back, have a seat, and we will get rolling with the uh, next session. So we come back uh, at um, 3.43.